Welcome to the Draw My Masterclass here at the Fabled Academy. Today we are taking a look at the Draw My Basics with Mara Ferris. She was the finalist of the third pro tour on Draw My and is also known as the mother of dragons in the flesh and blood community. Mara, welcome to the Fabled Academy. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate this. We want to take a look at how to play Draw My for beginners, but before we jump into the mechanics and the cards, Tell us, like, what is your experience actually on Draw My? I just, I, I love the hero. I started the game as a, as a prison main back, back in, in Monarch and then Tales and, and then Draw My kind of released right, just right when Prism was getting ready to LL. And so I, I've always had that, that fondness for dragons and that fondness for, for the more aggressive playstyle. Draw My really appealed to me very, very early on. And. I, I picked her up right right when she kind of came out and have been just hooked on her ever since. I love the playstyle. I love that the the being able to to summon these dragons and, and really kind of get into that. And it's been a lot of fun. What specifically do you like so much about Dromai? Uh I I think Dromai as a hero forces your opponent to make hard choices. I think this has always been kind of a hallmark of the illusionist class, but I think Dromai really embodies it. Dromai has this ability to say, you know, you can you can try to play aggressive against me, but then you're going to get swarmed by my dragons. Or you can try to deal with my dragons and you're going to get overwhelmed and, and have a hard time actually closing out a game. And I love that ability to make your opponent respond to you and make your opponent have to have to make th these hard choices. And putting your opponent in these like no win situations is really fun. We want to talk about the different playstyles with Dromai today, but also look at cards to pick up at first when building the deck. Is there anything before we jump into the playstyles that you want to add into when looking the first time at Dromai? I think Dromai is definitely a very unique hero. If you are looking to pick up Dromai for the first time, know that Dromai is not going to play quite like any other hero in the game. Most of the Flesh and Blood heroes are really looking to just, you know, That, that pit fight arena kind of, we're just trading blows. I'm going to hit you, you're going to hit me back. Dromai wants to play a slightly different game than everybody else. She's willing to trade a little bit of life away to be able to establish a board and, and really build up this, this swarm of dragons. And it's something that most other heroes really don't have access to. And it's, it's a little bit of a different mindset where you're not quite focused so much about trading life totals as you are being willing to make sacrifices for a more long-term gameplay. Be that, you know, playing out your dragons or with her her unique Ash mechanic where you're pitching red cards, which is typically not efficient, but you're trading out these little inefficiencies in the short term for long-term gain to be able to, to make these very powerful dragons, these very powerful permanents that no one else has access to. So I, I think if you're looking to get into Dromai, expect to take some licks early. I think She's a little bit unintuitive and she's a little bit difficult for a newer player to pick up for the first time, but I think can be very, very rewarding once you kind of get the feel of how, how she gets to play. So one of the hard things about Droma is that you can play her in so different ways with different outcomes too. So not only putting different cards in your deck, but then actually tackling the game in a different way. Can you tell us like what are the different play styles with Droma? Yeah, absolutely. It's sort of interesting, actually. Dromai has two very distinct playstyles. The one that we we kind of affectionately refer to as, as Big Dragon Dromai, which is this much slower, more kind of controlling game plan that wants to just block a lot, play very efficiently, and just slowly kind of grind the game out with the, the value of these big, powerful dragons. You see more of the big dragons like Tomaltai and Necria and these big beefy dragons that are kind of hard to deal with and they're looking to play this long slow game on kind of the flip side you have the dromai deck that i'm kind of known for which i think everyone has been referring to as empress dromai and it takes a very opposite approach it says i don't want to play this long game with you i don't want to play a slow grindy thing i want to flood the board and i want to hit you very very hard and very very fast and make you have to respond to my dragons while i'm hitting you in the face it it comes out of the gate swinging and gives your opponent a lot less breathing room and a lot less time to really deal with the the, the questions that draw is answering 
It's actually one of the things I like about Drawmine is that it makes it very difficult for people to really plan for Drawmine. I I had a game at a big tournament in Columbus a couple of weeks ago where I sat down across from my opponent and he was talking about how he had a thousand games on Talishar against Drawmine and he knew the <laughs> matchup inside and out. And then I just went, Rabble Rabble Scarblaze Snatch. <laughs> Which is just a whole lot of non-dragon attack actions in a rapid succession. And he just looked dumbfounded. <laughs> he was just like, I don't I don't know what to do anymore. And having having that different those those two very, very different playstyles in Dromai makes her very unpredictable and makes her very powerful in terms of being able to kind of dictate the way you want to play the game. So you touched on the tournaments that you are playing in with Dromai. Before we actually come to talking about the matchups. What are actually the biggest tournaments that you had success when playing Dromai? So I, I think the, the biggest one that everyone kind of knows is I did take, I took second at, Bal at uh, Pro Tour Baltimore. I just recently came off of uh, a nice little back-to-back -back string. I took 18th at Worlds this year in Barcelona and then top aided the Realm 20k in Columbus and then back-to-back -back top eights in, in Orlando this weekend. Last weekend? Yeah. So I've had a nice little string recently. I have several other, I think I've got three other Battle Hardened Top 8s and then several PTI events and some Pro Quests and things like that too. Yeah. But overall, overall, I've had a pretty good run on the hero, I think. It's also that you experienced different situations and different surroundings for Dromai to be in, right? This year, the meta has changed quite a lot. And at the moment, the meta is pretty different to what we have seen at the World Championship. So... What can you tell us about the matchups that you run into with Dromai and what are the best ones and what are the worst ones at the moment? Yeah, I, I think I've definitely, I think I've stuck with this hero through some some very favorable metas and some very not favorable metas. The the Empress Dromai mat, like deck itself was actually born out of the Phi meta. The, the traditional big dragon slow Dromai deck uh, historically has a very, very poor Phi matchup. Um, they want to play this really slow, grindy kind of matchup, and Phi just doesn't want to give you that opportunity. Um, in that meta was really where I started having to put together this more aggressive, um, very fast draw my deck to kind of keep pace. That said, Phi is still one of the matchups that you probably want to see the least. It can get a little scary. The the aggressive Empress draw my has a better Phi matchup, but it's still a little bit rough. Mask of Momentum is a very powerful card. It lets them draw cards when killing your dragons and so can kind of nullify a lot of the value that you get by playing these extra permanents. So Phi is always a little tough. Katsu is a little more manageable, especially in the more defensive draw my builds where you're a little bit more able to block his his big combo hits, but it's still another matchup you have to be very careful with just because they still have access to that master momentum. The other big one that everybody always kind of jokes about as is Bravo. The, the big, I think the big joke online is that Bravo Dromai is an 80-80 matchup because everybody on both sides always feels like they're favored. And it's a really interesting. It's actually one of my favorite matchups because in my experience, I've found that the Dromai Bravo matchup is a very, very skill intensive matchup on both ends. Bravo Dromai kind of feels like an arms race where both of you have all the tools to deal with everything the other is trying to do. You know, Bravo doesn't clear dragons particularly well because he doesn't have access to a whole lot of go again, but then he also does have a lot of six power attacks to, to break your phantasms. So then you can kind of get in this situation where you're like, well, if I try to play a long game, then the Bravo can turn really aggressive and not let me set up a big board. But then if the Bravo turns really aggressive, then I can kind of pivot to a more aggressive play style and then try to race him. And then if he starts blocking out, now I can kind of pivot back to a, a more fatigue plan and try to play a, a more setup game and build a big board. And so it's just this very interesting little like kind of cat and mouse of not only going and knowing your strategy, but knowing what your opponent is going to try to do to counter your strategy. And it's a lot of fun, but it can be a very skill testing and a very demanding matchup for a for a new draw my player. So what are the really good matchups then that you can run into with draw my? I think the best matchups tend to be the ones where they don't clear dragons particularly well. I know Assassin has typically been a, a fairly favored matchup, though some of the more redline aggressive Azuri lists have been interesting lately and have been trying to 
kind of do a little bit more racing. But generally speaking, Assassin has a very hard time clearing dragons. Azalea has a hard time with with clearing the board. Lexi, when when Lexi was still in the meta, Lexi was another one that you could really take advantage of her her lack of good ways of clearing dragons efficiently. And so like any of those matchups where you can really set up a board and then kind of take a more defensive posture and then just kind of let your dragons do a lot of the work always feel very good as a draw my player then also we are having a new set on the horizon heavy hitters new support mm -hmm. for guardian warrior and also brood is there anything that you can say about those classes that you might think are relevant for beginners to know when picking up draw my i i think we're about to see a whole lot of six power attacks come into the meta um so i I don't want to say I think it's going to be a tough time for Dromai, but I think it's going to be a very skill testing time for Dromai. Um, like we kind of talked about with the Bravo matchup, where you have a lot of tools to deal with these these classes that that have a high focus on on these six power attacks that that can break your phantasms. Um, and I think we're going to see more resurgence of that. And I think those matchups still can be very good for Dromai. Most of these classes that have these big single attacks don't clear boards particularly well. So there's still a lot of play for a Dromai player to really take advantage of those. Um, but it's definitely going to be a time where you want to make sure you get a lot of practice into knowing how to play into those matchups because they're not going to be the straightforward, I just hit you and you hit me back kind of matchups. Um, they're going to be a lot slower and you're going to want to be able to kind of take your time and and know when to attack with your dragons and when to hold back. I think it's going to be very important going in, going forward into this new meta. All right. So then let's talk about the most important cards to pick up in the beginning when playing draw my competitively. Are there mm -hmm. five cards that you can give, Are there five cards that you can give us to pick up from the majestic slot that are really important for draw my? So um I know, I know we said we want to start with Majestics, but I do probably want to touch on one Legendary real quick first, because I think Dromai overall is a very flexible hero, and because we have a lot of options, when we start going into the Majestics, we actually have a lot of flexibility on what things to pick up. There is, unfortunately, probably one card that it is going to be very difficult to play Dromai at a competitive level without, and that is Flamescale Furnace. It is her one real kind of linchpin like a Legendary. Dromai wants to play very few, if any, blue cards in her deck just because of the nature of her hero power. And so if we're going to facilitate that very red line strategy, we need some other way of getting resources. And Flamescale Furnace kind of is the, 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 the cream of the crop in that. So I, I do think, un unfortunately, you can play more budget lists of Dromai without it. But if you're really looking to get, get more into playing Dromai at, at a more serious level, I do think Flamescale Furnace is probably the, the first pickup before you look at anything else. That said, as far as the Majestics go, the the one that probably stands out the most is Tome of Imperial Flame. It was our newest card in, in Bright Lights. It is not mandatory for Dromai, and if you don't have access to it, because it does, Tome of Imperial Flame also, because we need to be royal for that, also means that we have to have a Crown of Dominion, which is the the royal headpiece that, or the, the legendary headpiece that gives us the royal yeah. keyword, which does sort of tie another legendary to the hero. That said, I don't think Tome is mandatory. I think it's a good, powerful card, but I had a lot of success on Dromai before Tome came out. But if you're really looking for that, that, that breakout majestic, I think Tome is probably the first one to look into. Other than that, I do run, I run in my normal list, I run both Command and Conquer and Enlightened Strikes. They're both just very powerful, very efficient cards, but I have run plenty of builds where I have not played either of them. Command and Conquer can very easily be swapped out for something like Ember Moss Enipi, mm -hmm. which is about a 10 cent card that's still very powerful and does, a, does not, not quite the same effect, has a very similar power level where you're just sending this one really big attack that fits the same kind of spot on your curve. And then other than that, Nourishing Emptiness is the other one that that I think a lot of people really enjoy playing. It's kind of fun. There's an interaction with Burn Them All, which lets you strip all the red, red cards out of your graveyard, and then Nourishing Emptiness to then come in with this attack that now that you have no attacks in your graveyard, this big, powerful, dominated attack. 
But I think those are pretty much the big marquee ones. If you're playing the more big dragon control style, Tomaltai and Dominia uh, are probably on that list. They're, they're pretty powerful, but also not terribly expensive to pick up. All right. You already touched on a second legendary that is needed when playing the deck more seriously. But can you say anything else to that headpiece that you just mentioned? Yeah, so the Crown of Dominion is, does do a lot for the deck too. It Not only does it make us royal, so it enables our tomes, the gold token that it gives us to start the game with is very good for generating those first couple of points of ash. Like we really want to spend a little bit of time in our very early game just establishing that board of ash. We'll, you'll see a lot of draw my decks will run Seeker's Myths for kind of the same reason to where we can just spend a little bit of time, build a little bit of ash and just have a base. But that gold token is also very, very good to just, if you, if you're on the, if you're going first in the game, just to start off by just going, I'm just going to pitch two cards, make two ash, draw a card, but maybe play a dragon on my first turn and get a really powerful board presence at the very beginning of the game. That, that said, I do also occasionally run both Crown of Providence and Arcanite Skullcap in some matchups. Like I say, we, we don't always need or, or even want that the, the tomes in our list for every matchup, especially matchups where we really need to be able to block. So having access to either Arcanite Skullcap or Crown of Providence can be a, a real boom sometimes. All right. So then let's take a look at the main play patterns that we want to pull off with Dromai. What is it really that made you execute the game plan for Dromai? I think the biggest thing that you really want to kind of consider with Dromai, and what I think what Dromai's real strength is, is Dromai's cards are kind of just better than yours. The, the average card for Dromai is just more above rate than, than an average card. You know, if, if we're saying you want an average card to do, you know, between three and, you know, three, three and a half damage is kind of like the sort of benchmark for most cards. You know, you want to be able to get between like 12 and 13 value out of like 12 and 13 damage or block out of, out of a standard hand. And Dromai, because of her dragons and her ability to build a board, can very often go substantially above that. And I think that's sort of the goal, whether you're playing a very aggressive Dromai or a very defensive Dromai, You want to be just doing very powerful things on every turn. You want to be able to, you know, play these big dragons that your opponent then has to spend resources to kill or play these big powerful attacks with, with some of these on hits. Like you'll see both like Command and Conquer and Snatch, which Snatch in particular has added value in a heavy red line deck just because, because when every card is red, your your threats of that card draw are very are more powerful than most other decks. I I think that's your your goal, whether you want to play aggressively or defensively, is just you want to be generating more value than your opponent on every turn. And then whether that's being very aggressive or playing very grindy is kind of uh, the the play patterns for for the two different styles of drama. I think. All right. So. The next question that we want to look at is the mistakes that can happen when picking up Dromai to let the viewers know what are the main mistakes, but then also how to become a master to avoid those mistakes. Oh gosh, I could go on this one for hours. I'll, I'll try to keep it a little bit brief. I think one of the biggest things that is kind of difficult for people to learn right off the bat with Dromai is your sequencing matters a lot more than it does in some other heroes. Um, the order you play your cards is very important for Dromai, um, particularly because of the way uh, Phantasm works. Uh, so Dromai, when, um, when you attack with a dragon, if they block it with a six power attack and break, break the Phantasm, um, you're not only going to lose your dragon, but you're also going to lose your go again, um, which means typically ending your turn. So you very often want to try to sequence your turns to where attacking with your dragons is either the last thing you're doing on your turn or very close to the last things you're doing on your turn. For example, if you have multiple dragons that you want to play, you usually want to make sure you are playing out all of your dragons before you attack with any of them. Because you don't want to get yourself in a position where you're going to play a dragon, attack with it, then they block with a six power attack, and then you're stuck holding three cards in your hand and a card in arsenal, and you just kind of lost your whole turn. So, like, 
I will often play out my dragons first, then uh, send my non-phantasm attacks that I might have, like if I have any ravenous rabbles or blazes or things like that, and then send my dragons kind of last, which does kind of also make things a little interesting when you have some of these bigger Chanander kind of attacks like Command and Conquer, where you have to start making some very informed decisions because cards like Command and Conquer sort of necessitate you holding cards in hand where you're going to be holding at least the Command and Conquer and the card that you're going to need to cast it. Which, I say card because you're probably going to be using Flame Scale Furnace, so you usually don't want to be casting cards like Command and Conquer by pitching two full reds. Which is probably another thing that, that you should probably learn is making sure to use Flame Scale Furnace effectively. You want to be on the turns where you want to be casting these big two power, these two costs, you want to kind of, again with the sequencing, you want to lead with a one cost attack and then be able to pitch a single card to flame scale furnace to net two resources and then send your two cost attacks. Like I say, we're, we're trying to be as efficient as possible in the deck. And so spending two red cards to throw a command and conquer is usually not where we want to be doing. Well, I, I think we kind of touched on this before too, but um, knowing when to attack with dragons and when not to attack with dragons at all um, is is another kind of part of this too that I think is is a little tricky and I think it's probably one of the hardest things for newer drill by players to learn and that is you know kind of understanding how many six power attacks you think your opponent probably has and how many of they have they used so it's a good idea if you want to play drill my kind of get a feel for every different hero and just a feel for how likely is that hero to have a lot of six power attacks we see decks like Ninja tend to run only about zero to three, but then like Mechanologist tends to run like eight to 10. And then of course, Guardian, we, we just assume Guardian has 60. <laughs> <laughs> Guardian tends to have between about 30 and 40, depending on the build, sometimes a little bit higher than that. And knowing that number can really affect your decision-making in when you want to attack and when you want to not attack with those dragons. Because I say like, we talked about if I want to play my Command and Conquer, I don't want to be stuck holding those two cards in hand very often. So I'm going to have to kind of make an educated decision of, well, I have, let's say I have two Ashwings and a, an Asvel I in play. And I know that my opponent is Phi. So he probably doesn't have a whole lot of poppers and maybe he's already shown me one. So then I can kind of say, you know what? He's only got maybe two in his deck and I think the odds of him having it are very low. So I'm a lot more willing to kind of attack with all the dragons before I play that Command and Conquer. As opposed to if I'm playing against, you know, a Mechanologist who I know has probably 10 poppers and hasn't shown me any yet and we're in the very early game, I might be a little bit more hesitant to attack with those dragons. I might just play the dragons to the board and then just throw the Command and Conquer without attacking with the dragons. And then make them spend their turn having to clear off these dragons while I'm still kind of getting that pressure in. And then, you know, when we talk about playing against Brute or Guardian, you can kind of take this to the extreme where often I will spend several turns in a row against these decks not attacking with my dragons at all. Sometimes with Guardian, I will go half the game not attacking with dragons and just build a board and build a board and build a board. And make them have to make these hard choices of do I want to you know the, they're starting to get a lot of dragons at play and you know these decks that don't clear dragons particularly well have to make this hard choice of man that's a lot of dragons do I want to take time off to kill these dragons while my opponent is still just attacking me or do I just ignore them and hope that when they do attack with the dragons I have my, my six power attacks in hand that I can kind of compensate for this and when we start adding dragons like Chromai and Miragai, um, Chromai giving us an extra action point and Miragai removing Phantasm from our first dragon, if they choose to ignore those dragons, we can suddenly put our opponent in a very bad position where we can have a Chromai and a Miragai and play them both at the same time. And now that Chromai is going to attack without Phantasm, give us two action points. And now suddenly they're forced to give us two more cards because we have so many dragons out, they're forced to give us two two six power attacks at the same time. And now we've kind of 
neutered their whole turn without having to commit a whole lot of our own. So then we get to come back to our next turn and just sort of do the same thing again, where we can just keep that pressure up, despite the fact that we know our opponent has those poppers every turn. And so I, I think that's a, a really important thing to learn and something that's very easy for, for a, a neutral my player to struggle with. Even just little little parts of sequencing, like knowing which dragons to attack with first. You know, you if if you don't know if they're going to have a popper or not, you know, maybe attack with your less valuable dragons. Know, you know, which dragons are your less valuable dragons. There's some matchups where you know mirror guy can be very powerful, and there's some matchups where mirror guy is maybe not so useful compared to something like Yenderai, who's very hard to deal with, or Kyloria, who can threaten card draw. Um, uh, or, you know, obviously our, our Ashwings tend to be very expendable. If they're going to have a popper, you want to give them the least value they can for it. Like sending your Ashwings first is often a very good idea, followed by the dragons that you are the most willing to give up should they, they have a way to kill them. And I think that changes a little bit in every matchup too. Yeah, so I, I think that's probably the biggest takeaway for if you're really looking to play a lot of Dromai is to really understand that that sequencing and the, the order that you play things. Um, uh, and then, oh, one last little other note to, to add to that is, remember your zero power, or your zero cost uh, go again attacks are very powerful in this deck because you have the ability to use those zero cost attacks to give all your dragons go again. It is often a really good idea to hold on to those zero cost attacks like like Ravenous Rabble or Burn Them All. These ones that are zero power and unconditional go again. Uh, I will often, rather than just throw those out onto the board, I will hold one of those in Arsenal so that I can be in a position where if we get into the game and I need to block with my whole hand, I can block my whole hand and then still have that starter ready to go to be able to still send the whole the whole team of dragons in. And I think that's a very powerful play pattern that Dromai has access to that most other heroes don't. You also touched on the importance of action points in Dromai and that Dromai is able with certain plays to generate more action points than other decks. For beginners, this can be quite hard to understand how to generate action points at first and how it really works to then leverage on those. So can you please from the start explain like how is how are these action points actually generated in Dromai? Sure. So the, the, the primary way we're usually generating action points is through go again. Dromai's hero ability lets us get go again on any of our dragons once we've played a red card. I, I think that one's kind of the, the more straightforward thing is just making sure we are playing those red cards every turn to make sure that we can keep sending our, our, our whole board full of dragons. But I think the other, the other really big one is Chromai, which Chromai is, is I, I would argue Chromai might be the most powerful dragon we have access to, if not one of the, the very most powerful. And Chromai just says, when Chromai attacks or dies, gain an action point once per turn. So you can't, you can't get both conditions. If, if Chromai attacks and then dies, you still only get one. But because when, when a dragon dies to Phantasm, you don't get that go again, so you lose that action point. Chromai can be a very powerful tool to give us that buffer, like we kind of talked about with the Guardian matchup, where if if you have that extra action point from Chromai kind of floating, if they have a, a, a six power attack, it no longer ends your turn immediately. So it can be very powerful to attack with Chromai first, especially if backed up by something like Miragai, to where the Chromai itself doesn't have Phantasm, and then get that extra action point. And now we're not quite as concerned with what do we do if they have that 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 six power attack. What do we what are we willing to give up quite as quite as much? We don't have to make nearly as many of these hard choices. So it lets us be a lot more flexible with our dragons and a lot more aggressive in terms of being able to attack without having to worry about our turn ending. And then uh, on top of that, we do have uh, some number of these very powerful cards that don't have go again that also pair very well with that, that bonus action point. Um, cards like Snatch, being able to play a Snatch with a floating action point suddenly make that, that extra drawn card 
very, very threatening. It's actually the same reason that you'll see a lot of draw my decks, particularly the aggressive draw my decks, running Snapdragon Scalers for kind of the same ability to threaten more action points than your opponent, essentially. More of these very powerful effects that might not otherwise have go again. And I think that's that's one of the, the other real strengths of Romite is being able to have access to these kind of tools to, to go really wide on your opponent in addition to having this board that they have to deal with. I feel like we touched on the most important I feel like we touched on the most important parts for beginning to play Dromai, but at the end here, is there a bonus tip that you can give away for beginners who want to pick up Dromai? Bonus tips. Like we, I think we mostly talked about the sequencing and I really think like, uh, just to come back to it again, I think sequencing is just so important. Really pay attention to the order you're playing your cards. You, especially in the, the more aggressive draw my builds, you have a lot of cards that also need other cards to be played before them. Um, so we have cards like Flame Call Awakening and and Blaze Headlong that really want those red cards played first. Um, you know, we have our two costs that really want you to play a one cost a one cost card first. So I think when you are building a draw my deck, kind of pay attention to all of those things that need other things to be played first. Um, you know, you want to have, I I like to tend to have at least between like 15 and 18 zero cost starters in the deck. I want to make sure that I have usually about twice as many one cost cards as I have two cost cards to make sure that I have always have access to those one costs to play my two costs. Uh, and I think one of the other big ones is pay attention when you are building a draw my deck to how many cards you have that are what we call ash positive versus ash negative ash positive cards are any card that you are going to play assuming you're pitching a red to it that will leave you with more ash than you started with cards like command and conquer is really good for for this because even if you're only pitching uh, a single card to flame scale furnace to play it you're still gaining an ash tome of imperial flame one of we kind of touched on being one of the strongest cards in the deck partially because tome of imperial flame kind of cheats that that ash economy where it leaves you with two ash when you play that card by itself uh, any of those cards you want to make sure you have uh, a lot of those one of the other ones that that's very popular that in the aggressive draw might is flame call awakening and flame call awakening is another really powerful one for generating ash because you can pitch a red card to the flame call awakening go get your phoenix flame then pitch the phoenix flame to flame scale furnace and then it gains you two resources as well as having two ash. So you want to make sure though in your in your deck building that you are balancing and making sure you have a lot of those cards that generate ash in addition to these very powerful cards that consume ash. Cards like Asvali and Chromai, these zero cost dragons that you can't pitch anything to so you can't generate ash on but will still consume the ash to play. Same thing with Rake the Embers. Even though Rake the Embers does generate some ash, it will generate usually two, one from its card text and one from pitching a red to it, but then makes three ash wings. And you really want to be able to make all three of those ash wings as, as often as possible because the ash wings are just very powerful. So it's another card that we consider ash negative typically because you're going to gain two, but then you're going to lose three. Making sure in your deck building that you have at least an even split of cards that will generate you ash to cards that will consume more ash. Otherwise, you can put yourself in bad positions where you have a handful of cards that are all really powerful, but you can't play any of them because you don't have enough ways to make that ash. And I think that's something else that's really important that's easy to kind of overlook when you just kind of want to cram all the most powerful cards into a deck. My voice is a little bit gone. So if any of the viewers still have questions on how to start to build Dromai and play her at competitive events, drop your questions down in the comment and also let us know if there are any other videos for beginners regarding Dromai that you want to see on the channel. Mara, thank you so much for taking the time today and diving with us into the into the basics with Dromai. I'm super happy to be here. I, I love this hero. I, I'm pretty obsessed with with everything that is that is Dromai. So I, I'm definitely also more than happy to ever talk Dromai about with pretty much anyone. 
I, I'm at Blackwing Studio on Twitter, and I'm also pretty active on Discord. My, my DMs are always open for either. If anyone ever just wants to talk drama or has any other questions, like please feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to chat. I also do have a Patreon with a pretty extensive uh, drama guide that I think we are closing in on about 50 pages now, um, as well as a very active um, patron Discord server uh, where we just discuss Dromai and Dromai related things pretty regularly. Perfect. That sounds like the surroundings that a Dromai player that is taking it really seriously definitely needs to take a look at. And I'm super stoked to see what you will bring up in the next year with Dromai being in the heavy hitter season. So we will see us in the next year for sure. I'm pretty excited. I think it's, it's, it's going to be a good year for Dragons. Perfect, that's a good ending. I will stop the recording.